soul hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside, they are all together become filthy, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now Harry did not know, I was going to speak on this and quote this verse today when he did that song just a moment ago. Isn't that interesting how the Lord works? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much for being you, for being there, for always being there for us. Father, we're so grateful that we have you to call our God, our Creator, our Lord, our Savior. You are constant and eternal. We thank you so much. And we thank you, Lord, for being here. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is even now moving among us. I, Father, I pray that you'd help us to to not be distracted by thoughts of anything else going on in our lives or outside these walls. Father, I pray that you'd help us to put everything else aside, to be still for a brief time and know that you are God, to look into your word, to allow your Holy Spirit to have free reign in our thoughts today, that we might be able to concentrate on your word and what you have for us this morning. May you show yourself to us, we pray in Jesus' name. And for his sake, with thanksgiving, amen. Today we're going to begin a new series, a brief series, about six weeks, uh, five or six weeks, on, uh, um, called The Rest of the Story. One, two, three, four, five, six weeks. Uh, we'll be covering different subjects, um, such as this one today, There Is No God. We'll be talking about unfaithful spouses. We'll be talking about uh, wayward children. We'll be talking about um, problems in, in the workplace. We'll be talking about discouragement in life. We'll be covering all kinds of topics the next six weeks, things that uh, a lot of folks go through, especially this time of year. I don't know if you realize it or not, but this time of year, from, say, Thanksgiving on till uh, through, through the darkest part of winter and the coldest part of winter, there, there's a lot of, of issues that f- folks go through, spiritual issues, psychological issues that, that people deal with, so much so that... Believe it or not, funeral homes are extraordinarily busy right now. Um, Some folks are having to wait a week, week and a half, two weeks before they can even get in and make an appointment to talk to a funeral director to schedule their loved one's funerals. It's amazing. It's really, really busy. And it's not just because of COVID. It's because of uh, all kinds of things. Uh, There's a lot of discouragement, a lot of people just giving up. It's not that they're committing suicide, although that does increase this time of year but people just give up on life. And so there's a lot of things that that folks are dealing with in the darkness and coldness of winter in in spite and maybe in light of all the holidays that are going on. It exacerbates people's feelings of loneliness and isolation, uh, and and it, it it just culminates in spiritual and psychological disaster for many people. So today we're talking about one of these topics. We'll cover the other ones as we go through the next month or so. But today we're talking about there is no God. But the, the theme of this whole series is the rest of the story. Now, for those of you who are younger, you may not know what I'm talking about, but years ago, there was a radio commentator named Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey was on the radio a lot. Uh, he, he would uh, update you on the news of the day in a very folksy manner, but he also had some, some uh, features in his broadcast, and one of them was this the rest of the story. Uh, He would do this periodically. It'd be about three minutes and 40 seconds, three minutes, 45 seconds for each one. And he would talk about the other side of an issue that maybe you already knew something about. Here's an example. We're going to play one of those clips now. Mrs. Paul is the choir director for the West Side Baptist Church in Beatrice, Nebraska. Her daughter, Marilyn, is the church pianist. Neither has ever been late for choir practice To the contrary, both are in the habit of arriving 15 minutes early. But now it's Wednesday evening, March 1, 1950, and choir practice begins at 7.30, and this will be the first time either Mrs. Paul or her daughter Marilyn has ever been late for choir practice, but do you know what? Do you know what? There are 18 members in the Westside Baptist Church Choir in each and every one that very same night. 
is late for practice. All 18 had perfectly valid excuses, and all of them are late. Every member of the West Side Baptist Church Choir was late for practice that one night. 18 members, and each of them was tardy. The choir director's excuse was that her daughter, the church pianist, had fallen asleep after dinner and did not awaken in time. But wait till you hear some of the other excuses. My goodness, LaDonna Van de Grift, a high school sophomore, was having trouble with her homework. Like Mrs. Paul and her daughter, Miss Van de Grift knew that practice began promptly, so she always came early, but this evening she was detained by a particularly baffling geometry problem. Royina Estes and her sister Sadie were ready to leave their house on time, but the car would not start. Ordinarily, Mrs. Schuster was 10 minutes early for choir practice. The night of March 1, she was detained at her mother's house. Herb Kipp was at his own home. Would have been early, too, but there was this important letter he had to write. He'd been putting it off for some time, and the time got away from him. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Joyce Black would probably not have been early, but she would have been on time except that it was just so cold out that evening, she wanted to stay in the house until the last possible minute, and so she was late. Harvey All, A-H-L, would have been on time, but his wife was out of town, and that left him in charge of their two young sons. A friend had invited Harvey and the two boys out to dinner, and a pleasant conversation carried them away, and Harvey was late. Then there was Lucille Jones and Dorothy Wood, high school girls. They lived in the, in the houses next door to one another. And Lucille was listening to a half-hour radio program that began at 7 o'clock. She just had to hear how it ended, so Dorothy waited for her. Pastor Klempel and his wife were always on time for choir practice, but not the evening of March 1. Pastor Klempel's wristwatch, the accuracy of which was all, always so precise, that night was five minutes slow. The remaining choir members had equally valid excuses for their tardiness, excuses, excuses, 18 excuses, never before nor since had each and every choir member of the West Side Baptist Church been late for choir practice on the same evening. That was Wednesday, March 1, 1950. Choir practice was scheduled as usual for 7.30 p.m. Nobody showed up at 7.30. 7.30 the precise time that a natural gas leak surfacing in the basement of the West Side Baptist Church was ignited by the furnace and the church blew up and was demolished. And the old furnace of the West Side Baptist Church was directly below the choir loft. And now you know the rest of the story. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. So there's always more to the story, isn't there? Well, that's what we want to talk about each week during this series, and, t- and today we want to talk about uh, atheism. We want to talk about the fact that, uh, that many people, in fact, I'm going to say most people in our world around us, either are atheists or act like atheists. Now, atheism is on the increase. I don't know if you realize it or not. As polls uh, come out periodically, um, people have been uh, surveyed and questioned uh, off and on for years and years and years. For example, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, uh, polls would show how many people believed in God, how many people go to church, how many people read their Bible, how many people believe that Jesus died for their sins, uh, how many people believe you get to heaven some other way, all these different kinds of polls. There are all kinds of groups that do that. Gallup, George Gallup used to do this years ago. Uh, in, in more recent years, George Barna has done it uh, on behalf of Christians. Uh, but there have been many others in between as well who ask people in general what they believe, what they do, and how they act, and things of this sort. And as a result of all these different polls, we have learned that Atheism is on the increase. It's on the rise. There was a time when to be an atheist meant that you were marginalized. You know, you, there was a stigma on, on those who believed that there was no God. And many atheists were afraid to voice their views. This is no longer the case. Atheists are shouting it from the rooftops and on TVs and, and on radio and in books and very proud of their atheism. It used to be far more subtle, and that's no longer the case. And because of that, they are actually 
I'm going to use this term intentionally, they are evangelizing other people to atheism. More and more people are finding it acceptable to be an atheist, claiming to be an atheist. But I, I want to point some things out, and let's get into your blank here a little bit, your, your blanks, I should say, in your handout. The fool as says there is no God. We just read that in Psalm 14, verse 1, didn't we? The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. <laughs> it is a foolish thing, very foolish. In fact, I don't believe in atheists. You know that? I think it's such a foolish idea that I don't believe in atheists. Atheists don't believe in God. I don't believe in atheists. Now, why do I say that? I mean, I just said there's a, that atheism was on the rise, didn't I? What is atheism? Atheism is the idea that there is no God. They don't believe there is a God. But I don't believe that anybody believes that. Atheists do believe in a superior being. Isn't that what God is? No matter what your religion is, isn't God a superior being? Atheists believe in a superior being. But the superior being is themselves. Themselves. So by the strict definition of the word atheist, I don't believe there is such a thing as an atheist because atheists do believe in a superior being, but they believe it's themselves. And lest you doubt that, uh, I, I happen to look up quotes by atheists, and they would actually say this. Here's a quote. I don't, I don't know who actually said this, but this is a quote that I, I, I found. This guy said, and I'm quoting him word for word, I was an atheist until I realized I was God. A guy named Connor McGregor, and I don't know who that is, Connor, C-O-N-O-R is how he spells his first name. Connor McGregor said this, quote, I believe in believing. My coach, John Kavanaugh, is a big atheist, and he is always trying to persuade people to his way of thinking, and I think, what a waste of energy. If people want to believe in this God or that God, that's fine by me, believe away. But I think we can be our own gods. I believe in myself. So he claims to be an atheist, but he believes in himself as the God, right? A man named A.A. A. Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, said this, quote, In this moment, I am euphoric, not because of any phony God's blessing, but because I am enlightened by my intelligence. And it goes on and on and on. I could stand here and quote things all day from atheists who actually made statements indicating they believe that they are the highest intelligence, the most superior being in the universe. Isn't that what God is? So they believe that they are God. So they're not strictly atheists. They just don't believe in the God that really exists, the God that the Bible talks about. They set themselves up as gods. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest uh, Christian apologists of our time, said this, he said, quote, atheists express their rage against God, although in their view, he doesn't exist. You know, if there's something I don't believe in, if I don't believe it exists, why would I spend so much time talking about it, writing about it, lecturing about it, proclaiming my views against it? Doesn't that seem ridiculous? Doesn't that seem like a waste of time? Uh, I don't believe that there are little green men flying around from space, you know, or that the moon is made of green cheese. Do you hear me preaching against the moon being made of green cheese? No. Why would I spend my time if, if, if I don't believe it's true, you know? Why would I preach against little green men flying around in space if I don't believe they exist? Yet atheists spend an extraordinary amount of time and effort in, in writing books and lecturing and teaching and debating and arguing against something they don't believe in. Doesn't it make you wonder? Why? Because there's a deep-seated belief in every person that there is a God, that we are not the supreme being in the universe, yet they will not admit that. But those are those who declare themselves to be atheists. But the next, next blank, I think you've got another blank there that says, not only atheists, but practical atheists as well. Practical atheists, that's quote. Now, this is my term. 
for those who claim to believe in God, yet live as if there wasn't one. I think that's very common. By the way, I think a Christian. I believe a Christian. A Christian, of course, you understand, is someone who not only believes in God, but believes that they are a sinner in need of a Savior, and there's been a time and a place in their life when they've turned from their sin and trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. This is a person who is going to spend eternity in heaven with God, right? This is what we call a Christian. I believe that there are Christians who are practical atheists. Now, why do I say that? Because I think there's a lot of people, Christians included, who live every day on their own as if there wasn't a God. I think I mentioned this a week or two ago. I don't recall if it was on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Thursday afternoon. I don't know. I get them all jumbled together, and I don't remember which day I said what. But I said uh, something to the effect that this was the lie in the Garden of Eden when Satan told Eve, ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. I'm sure you've heard me say this before. But when we continue to believe Satan's lie that we are gods and we can make decisions, we can set our own goals, we can make our own plans, we can live our own lives as we please, we are essentially saying, hey, I don't need God. I can do that myself. I can make my own decisions. I can make my own choices. I can make my own discernments. I don't need God to do that. Thank you, God, for saving me. I can take it, I can take it from here. That's what many Christians, and I put that in quotation marks, do. They want the salvation, but they don't want to serve. And that's what I mean by practical atheists. There are many of those. Samson was that way. He said he believed in God, but his whole life was lived for himself in the book of Judges. By the way, the book of Judges, you can almost take that, I'm not going to say take it out of the Bible, it belongs in there for a reason, but take it apart from the rest of the other books of the Scripture and don't live your life by anything you read in the book of Judges. Don't point to anything in that book and say, well, it it happened here in the book of Judges, it must be okay. The whole book of Judges, the the point of which is that that it it begins by saying this. It begins by saying, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And it ends in chapter 21 by saying, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The whole book is about people and governments and societies and families who lived according to their own rules, who did that which was right in their own eyes. And isn't that exactly what's going on in our society today? You're okay, I'm okay. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. That's your truth, this is my truth. You hear it all the time. They are essentially quoting the book of Judges. Hey, let's do that which is right in our own eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, that's practical atheism. That's leaving God entirely out of the equation. And I think it's rampant in Christian churches today across the country and around the world, but especially in the United States and Western Europe. Places where Christianity used to thrive, used to be strong, used to be evangelistic, used to be growing, used to be changing society, but now is in the place where society is changing the church. So Jonah was another one who said he believed in God. After all, he was a prophet of God, right? God called him and commissioned him to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel. Jonah, of course, went the other way and said, I'm not evangelizing those folks. I hate them. I don't want to see them in heaven. I don't want to live next to those people forever. So God told, turn Jonah into fish bait, right? You know the rest of the story. But Jonah believed in God, yet lived as if God didn't exist. He wanted to make his own decisions. He wanted to put his own calling on his own life. He still tried to talk God out of it. And he was still mad when 120,000 people got saved because of his sermon. He didn't preach it because he 
wanted to. He didn't preach because he loved the people. He hated their guts. He was upset when they all came to the altar and got saved. Not one person was left in the congregation. They were all at the altar. Every last person in town got saved. And he was mad. He was mad because God didn't agree with him. He wanted to be God. Judas Iscariot said he believed in God. He said he believed in Jesus. The Lord commissioned him to do great miracles. Remember, he was along with the other apostles. He healed the sick, even raised the dead, cast out demons just like the rest of them. Yet he wanted to make his own decisions, his own choices. Where is he now? That's all you need to say, right? Just point your finger. There he is. He's down there. He's still there today. Judas wanted to be God. We can believe in God, but believing in God doesn't mean that we submit ourselves to Him or we live as if there is a God. James 2.19 says this, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Does it do them any good to believe in God? No. Demons do believe in God. They probably believe in God more than anybody else does. That they sure don't act like he's in charge. They still want to do their own thing because they followed Satan, who was Lucifer in the beginning when God created him sinless, yet he wanted to be God. Remember that? He knew there was a God. He believed in God, undoubtedly so. He was made to worship God. His whole body reflected that. The jewels in his body that reflected the light of the glory of God. The pipes in his body that made music as he flew through the air and glorified God as a worship, a leader of worship. Yet, his heart was lifted up and he wanted to be in God's place. He said, I will be like the Most High, Isaiah 14. And the more he wanted to go up, the further he went down. And he went from being Lucifer to becoming Satan. And all those who follow him want to do what he does. That's why the Lord said to the scribes and the Pharisees and the other people in in John chapter 8, ye are of the devil. You are the children of your father. And your father is the devil. He's a liar and the father of it. You're just like him. He's a murderer. You're just like him. And those today who want to do what Satan does be as gods. We are practical atheists as well when we do that. And I think there are times when all of us do that, but I think we need to repent every once in a while and realize and resubmit to ourselves to God and realize that God is God and I am not, right? Point number two, the world says there is no God. Not just the fool, but the world says this. In 2 Chronicles 32, verses 10 through 15, we see this. Thus saith Sennacherib, king of Assyria, whereon do you trust that ye abide in the siege in Jerusalem? Doth not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and by thirst, saying, the Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria? What's going on here is Sennacherib, the, the, the people to the north east of, of uh, Israel, back then, was was bringing a huge army in to invade Israel. And Hezekiah was king of Judah at that time, and he wanted to defend the country. He was trying to placate Sennacherib as much as he could, but but he was also teaching his people, don't fear the Assyrians, trust in God, because he will defend us. Because God had warned them before that, when you see armies lined up against you, don't fear them, because I will defend you. And by the way, that's still true today in Israel. Because Israel is God's land. The physical land is God's. The people are God's, and God will defend it. This is, and I'm going off track here just a little bit. I'm going to follow just a brief rabbit trail. But in 1967, when all the armies surrounding Israel, from Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, when they all surrounded Israel, and at the same time were preparing to attack Israel from all sides. And remember, Israel is a very small country. In the middle of Israel, from, from, uh, from the, what was then at the West Bank, it's still called the West Bank today, but it was 
unoccupied by Israel at the time, to the Mediterranean Sea was only 11 miles wide. 11 miles. It's not very far. That's not much further from here to downtown Columbus. Very narrow country. And so they were all going to, to surround it. They were going to cut Israel in half and piecemeal it. Yet Israel uh, attacked when, when all these, these the, the forces were, were massed all around the Israeli border. Israel attacked and in six days defeated every one of those countries simultaneously. They went into Syria and, and captured the Golan Heights. They went uh, over into Jordan and, and captured the West Bank, what is known as the West Bank. And I, I believe it's part of Israel, supposed to be part of Israel, but many people call it the West Bank. They went down this direction all the way to uh, the Suez Canal, the entire Sinai Peninsula. They, they captured all six days. Why six days? Because they had to rest the seventh day, right? God was the one who won that war for them. They did it again in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. Again, they defeated all their enemies. Every, ever since Israel became a nation on May 14, 1948, in fact, in fact the, the war against Israel started the very next day, uh, um, May 15, 1948. They were attacked and, and they've been defeating their enemies ever since because it's God who is defending them. So Hezekiah says, don't fear the Assyrians. God is our defender. He will take care of it. And so Sennacherib is saying, hath not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, you shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it? Know ye not what I and my fathers have done unto all the people of other lands? Were the gods of the nations of those lands anyways able to deliver their lands out of mine hand? Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people out of mine hand that your God should be able to deliver you out of mine hand? He's saying, your God can't defend you. That's what he's saying. Now, therefore, let not Hezekiah deceive you nor persuade you on this manner, neither yet believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of mine hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of mine hand? In other words, he's saying, I don't believe in your God. That's what he's saying. I don't believe in your God. Don't think that God's going to defend you. No other God, and he's at small g, uh, no God of any nation has been able to deliver those nations from the hands of my fathers who defeated them or from me who's defeated them. <laughs> what makes you think your God can, de can defend you? Well, what happened? Oh, my goodness, they were soundly defeated. I won't read the rest of it. That's the rest of the story. You can read that yourself. But God defended them very, very handily. He took care of the whole thing because God does exist in spite of what Sennacherib thought. We also live in a society today. I'm very, very sorry to say that the United States government has kicked God out of the public arena, out of our schools, out of our government. They don't want anything to do with God. There is a massive effort underway to build a secular society in our country. How did that work for other nations? Scripture says that the nations shall be turned into hell and every nation that forgets God. And folks, we're living smack dab in the middle of that nation. It's a scary place to be. And don't think for a second that when judgment comes on our nation that we are going to be spared. We will suffer right along with it. We already have. We've already been under God's judgment, I think, for some time. I don't want to get off track that direction, but we have seen various ways in which God has judged our nation. But point number three, and now the rest of the story. God declares His existence. He declares His existence. Isaiah 44, verses 6 and 8, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses." Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is not. 
There is no God. I know not any. God declares His existence. He doesn't explain it anywhere. Nowhere. I've heard numerous people over the last, oh, 40, how long has it been? I don't know how long I've been in the ministry, 1975 till now. Was that 46 years? I've, not, I've, not, I've heard a lot of people say, well, God needs to explain His existence. Why does He just say that He exists instead of explaining His existence? Well, let me ask you. Let's be reasonable about this. Okay? I'm meeting you for the first time. Hi, my name is Paul Gabriel. How are you? And you look at me and you say, no, you're not real. I say, yeah, I am. I am. I, I'm here. No, no. I explain yourself. Explain your existence. You know, am I going to stand there and say, well, okay, I, w I was born at a very early age in life. You know, I don't remember the beginning, but, but I, I remember growing up I was real little and I grew up, went to elementary school. Do I have to give you my life story to prove I exist? I mean, isn't that ridiculous? God exists. Why does he have to prove himself? We don't do that. Uh, when, when, when I introduce myself, I don't have to do that. How about if I introduce you? I'm, I'm, I'm introducing you to someone else. Uh, l let me do it this way. Uh, w think of somebody who was universally known. Can you think of anybody who everybody would recognize if they met him or if they saw him? Santa Claus? Okay, here I'm trying to prove that God exists. You want to give me to use Santa Claus as an example. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about a real person. Ronald Reagan? Okay, that's probably true. Um, Bill Gates? Okay. Um, well, let's go with Ronald Reagan, okay, because he's very identifiable. I think a lot of people would recognize him. If I were to bring him in here and, and stand him up here, let's say he was alive, you know, uh, brought him in here, and I were to introduce him as Ronald Reagan, um, w w wouldn't you know who he was? Would anybody doubt his existence or that he was really who he said he was? It's like God. When I'm introducing God, I don't have to explain who he is. He, he is already known. You may not know his by appearance. You may not know his name. But every person is born with an innate knowledge that there is a God. Let me give you an example of that. Um, every time, to, well, I'm, I'm talking thousands of years of exploration and discovery. When discoverers and ex explorers have traveled from, from one country to a, the next, going across uh, great seas and oceans and going to various islands and other continents and going back into deepest jungles every time they've gone to a new civilization. And keep in mind that, that uh, back in the, in the day, we didn't have trains, we didn't have uh, planes, we didn't have mass transportation. When, when people grew up in, in isolated areas all around the world, various continents, islands, jungles, uh, deserts, all kinds of different isolated areas. But every time a, a, an explorer has gone to, to find a new people group, a new tribe of people somewhere, every single time they have a religion which worships some form of God. Nobody taught them that. It's innate. Everybody understands that. We have never found... In all of human history, we have never gone anywhere and found a civilization that was atheistic in nature. They've all had some sort of God that they worship. God declares His existence. He doesn't explain it. Your next blank is the universe declares His existence. Psalm 19 verses 1 through 3 says, To the chief physician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The fact that the world exists is evidence that somebody made it. 
preacher behind a pulpit made of wood. It didn't just grow this way. I mean, it is made of wood, but I've never seen a tree shaped like this. This was made at First Baptist Church of Atwater, Ohio, many years ago. That's where we got it. This uh, scroll down here with the Bible on it, that was made by an Amish gentleman up in Holmes County a number of years ago. It's been made by somebody. It didn't just happen. <clears throat> Jessica's back there on a computer broadcasting the service live on Facebook. We have a camera. We have a computer. A computer is proof that someone designed it. It didn't just happen. Someone designed it. When a robot lands on Mars, soft lands, turns itself on, opens up its antennas, starts driving around, scooping up soil, taking pictures and sending them back to Earth, it's because someone started it. Someone planned it that way. It didn't just happen. When the universe began... It's proof that someone started the whole thing going. Isn't that a no-brainer? Now, there was a time when I didn't believe that, but that's because I was taught that every day, every week, every month, every year for 13 years. Yeah, I was brainwashed. Your kids are being brainwashed if your kids are in public schools. They're being taught not to believe in God. That was the whole reason evolution became a popular theory. It was the best explanation, I don't believe it is, but the best explanation that the world could come up with to eliminate God from their thinking. But folks, Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. It goes on to say in the second half of that verse, I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. It's going to happen. You can either be a part of it or you can suffer because you're not going to be a part of it. But folks, here's what I think. Since there is a God, since there is a God, we are His because we didn't just happen. You are more complicated than that computer back there. There is more design to you, more planning for you than there is in that computer back there. You belong to Him. Since He exists, you are His. Since God exists, you and I are accountable to Him. And this is why the world fears Him so much and wants to get rid of Him so much. They don't want to be accountable to anyone. Remember, ye shall be as gods. If you are a god, then you don't have to be accountable to anybody else. But since there is a god, we should fear him. I don't mean you have to run around being terrified all the time and and, and cower in a little fetal position and, and go into a catatonic state because you're terrified but we should live in fear every day. Listen, those of you who know the Lord, have known the Lord for a long time, and your relationship with the Lord is good, you're reading your Bible all the time, you're talking to Him all the time, you go to church all the time, your relationship is really good, don't you still fear the day when you will stand before Him and give an account for every idle word and action? I do. I do. I sure do. I just read a book, just finished a book by Edward Snowden. You guys remember the name Edward Snowden, the NSA guy and uh, worked for the CIA and the, and the NSA um, in 2013, was it, 2014? He, um, he left the NSA and he flew to, he was in Hawaii, he flew to um, Hong Kong and met with a couple of journalists there and gave them thousands and thousands of files that he had stolen from the NSA. Uh, And his major revelation was that um, the U.S. government was spying on everybody, that they're reading our emails and listening to our phone calls and things of this sort. 
And this was his major revelation, and it's supposed to be a major shock that the government is doing this. I understand that, that the government shouldn't be doing that. That's illegal, right? It's not constitutional. According to the uh, Fourth Amendment uh, against reasonable search and seizure, uh, yeah, they shouldn't be doing that. It's not my point to get off track on that. But what I was amazed at was that he was shocked to find this out. Of course, he was a young man. He was 29 years old when he, when he uh, left and, and took all those documents with him. He was uh, uh, about 23 or 24 when he started realizing the extent of the spying that the government was doing on its own people. And he was shocked. I mean, he was absolutely stunned at this. And I'm thinking, why was he shocked? Why was it such a surprise? I mean, l- let me ask you the question. When those revelations came out, were any of you shocked to find that out? Were you surprised to learn that the government was spying on you? No, I kind of assumed that all along, right? I mean, there's cameras at every intersection. There's cameras at every store. Almost every building has it. I mean, you can access them anywhere. You can get on the internet, and you can have been able to do this for a long time. And I think I've talked about this before. Uh, you can get on the, 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 I think it's Columbus's website, and you can, you can track a vehicle all the way through town. If you, if you find a vehicle that you can identify, and I like to do this once in a while. I used to do it. I, I don't have time anymore, but had a, a, a semi-truck, a, a colorful semi-truck, and I'd watch it from the time it, it uh, crossed um, Rome Hilliard Road out there on, on 70, all the way till after it passed, um, oh, I forget the road, it out past 270, on the other side, on the east side. You'd follow it all the way through town. A- anybody could do this. You, could, you can spy on anybody. Uh, you know all, full well that you can get on the computer. You're not the government, but you can get on the computer. You can call up anybody's name. Some of you are probably going to learn this for the first time. You can bring up anybody's name. You can find out where they live, what their phone number is, where they work, who their relatives are. Uh, you can find out how long they've lived there. You can find out all the other addresses they've lived at uh, that, are, that are recorded. You can learn uh, how much they paid in taxes, how many bedrooms they got, how many bathrooms they got, how many square footage they've got. Uh, you can find out anything about anyone on a computer. And, and what I'm saying, and the whole point I'm saying this is that from the moment I got saved back in 1972, I knew that not only is there a God, that I'm accountable to Him, that I'm going to stand before Him someday, but also that he's watching everything I do. He knows everything I think. He knows everywhere I go. He knows everything I say. And he's keeping a recording of all of it. And this was the other thing that shocked Edward Snowden. His book is called Permanent Record. He was shocked that not only is the government recording everything, but it also keeps a permanent record of it all. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's no shock either. God keeps a permanent record of everything. And there there used to be a gospel track called This Was Your Life. Many of you have seen it. And it's the idea that when we stand before God someday, our whole life is going to be played back. Every word, every action, we're going to give account for someday. Folks, that, that makes me, I'm not going to say worry, but I don't look forward to that. Okay, and those that that thought is foremost in my mind all the time. I mean, I know what, when I go into a store, I know I'm under surveillance. When I'm driving down the street, I know I'm under surveillance. But folks, everywhere I go, even when I was in like a a, a cave, uh, a wild cave with with just me, and I was the only one there, I I knew I was under surveillance. God is watching, all the time. He's foremost in my thoughts, and he needs to be in all of our thoughts as well. Since there is a God, we should always be mindful of Him. And this is the point I want to get across to you. Not only is there a God, but you and I need to be constantly mindful of Him and thinking of Him. He needs to be in our thoughts all the time. This is what the Lord said to, when He was speaking to Joshua in Joshua 1.8. He said, be always in the Word and be, be meditating in it day and night. It's not just talking about the Bible. But Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He needs to be in our head 
day and night, all the time. And I think if we think that way, if the Lord is constantly in the, in the uppermost thoughts of our head all the time, every day, we don't need to worry about cameras. We don't need to worry about government surveillance. We don't need to worry about police. We don't need to worry about anything because the Lord will keep us straight, right? It means we'll watch what we do on Facebook. It means we'll watch what we do on Saturday night. It means we'll watch what we do when we're watching TV or a computer. Well, it's quiet in here. Anyway, here's my challenge. How often are you still in the presence of God? I don't mean continuing to be, but the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. How often are you still? Our lives are so full of activity. There's so much going on. There's always so much noise. Even in my, my own life, when, when I, 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 I can't just read a book uh, uh, or work on a computer. I almost have to have the TV on all the time in the background. And I've got the computer here, and I might have a book over here, and I've got, I've got stuff going on all around me, and, and it, it, it's I'm filling every thought, every sound wave is, is filling my ear, and, and it's, it's like I'm hardly ever still, you know? I have to force myself at times to turn off the TV, turn off the computer, and get alone with God. Just me and my iPad. That's where I read my Bible. And, and just, just get alone with God in the quiet time. And, and it's not that easy to do. And it's, and it's not that way. If I'm sure if it's not that way with me, it's got to be that way with you too. Our lives are very, very busy. Much busier than they were for people 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago. Our lives are very, very complicated. So how often are you still? We need to make an effort to be still in the presence of God. How often do you bask in the presence of God? And just enjoy His presence. In the quiet time. Like this. Sometimes it's uncomfortable when things are quiet. Have you ever noticed in conversation when no one says anything for a few seconds. It's uncomfortable for some. I feel like I should be saying something. Somebody say something. But sometimes we just need to be quiet. And remember that God guarantees that He will be exalted among the heathen. He will be exalted on the earth. We need to be a part of making Him exalted beginning in our lives. Father, may your will be done in our lives. May your will be done in these next few minutes as our responses honor and glorify you. May you be glorified through us. May you be exalted right here, right now. For we ask it in Jesus' name, for his sake, with thanksgiving. Amen. Would you stand with us as we have a time of invitation as the praise team sings? Whatever the need, you come. We've got counselors who'll be right down here on the front row. They'll be glad to pray with you about anything, uh, help you with scripture, any answers to anything, if you want them to, whatever the need, you come. <coughs>
snow. All right, just a reminder that this coming Friday, there will be a service for Mary Lewis at Newcomer Funeral Home on 161. Uh, viewing is 11 o'clock. Service is at, at uh, noon. Uh, so if you can be there to support the Lewis family, I'd appreciate that. If not, please keep them in prayer. Keep them in prayer, yeah, actually, either way, if you would. And then tonight at 6 o'clock, 2020, uh, as usual. And uh, Brother Don, I'm going to ask if you come and close us in prayer, please. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for the time together and worship and prayer and and your message, and Lord, we just pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to touch our hearts with the message, that your message will find lodging. Father, if there's one here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, we know that your word says today is the day of salvation. Lord, we just thank you again for Pastor Paul and uh, the ability that you give him to put a message out there plain and simple and, and yet stirs our hearts. Father, we just ask you to protect us on the roads, bring us back tonight at the next appointed time, and we'll give you the praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.